Amen, amen. You can be seated for just a minute. Just a minute, just a minute. Man, what a day. Um, there's something I need to do before we continue on. I, people that um, I, I want to um, just to acknowledge. Um, first, uh, Farrell Coppage, I need you to stand up for just a minute. Um, I, I don't know where we would be today if you, Farrell Coppage, didn't stand in the gap and be obedient to God's call. And we will never understand the work that you've done with the WCA in this church with the announcement of the Global Methodist Church and the work that you've done there, um, you're the man, and I'm thankful for you. <clears throat> Dave Perry, I need you to stand up. I am thankful for your faithfulness. I am thankful that you at times had the hardest job of the whole group. And um, I appreciate your, your demeanor to take criticism, to answer questions that would just absolutely frustrated me to answer. But you answered them with grace and love and dignity and you're a man of high character and integrity and I'm thankful for you. Brian McNeely, I need you to stand up just a second. <laughs> Brian and I are um, a lot alike. <laughs> Sometimes uh, uh, we speak before we thought it all the way through. <laughs> um, but I'm thankful for your tenacity uh, you took what we do here in terms of finances as a second job during this season. And he was here every week and he met with Mark almost every week. He was on the phone with me almost every day. And I, I'm thankful for you and what you've done. Thank you. Uh, Casey Alarcon, where's Casey? No, 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 no. Lord have mercy, you talking about uh, somebody who grabbed the hold of something and won't let it go. That's her. Casey, thank you for standing in the gap and walking this out wasn't popular sometimes, it was quite difficult. Um, we all shed a lot of tears, almost weekly. And I'm thankful for you and your love for this church and for your grace through all of this. Thank you. <clears throat> Andy Slavin, the chairman of our trustees is not here today. Uh, he is taking his son to college at a, a lesser SEC school, Texas A&M. Um, but uh, that's where he is. And so uh, obviously we want him to be there with his family during this time. But Andy, 
I'm thankful for you and I appreciate your friendship uh, through all of this. And um, you two are a man of high character and integrity and I, and I love you. There's a couple of other people that I want to recognize today that um, started uh, this journey and they were with us all the way, um, but uh, stepped out of the sort of the, the front line to the second line. Lindsay Hill, I see you back there. You need to stand up just a second. Rustin, don't sit down too long, stand up. <laughs> Rustin Parsons. <laughs> I am thankful for both of you. Uh, when all this went down, I called Farrell Coppage first, and my second call was to Lindsay Hill. And uh, I was, as you might, um, Imagine was pretty stressed out in the moment and she was calm and cool and collective. And I'm thankful for that in you. And Rustin, you at times had a hard job and I'm thankful for you and the work that you've done and just helping keep all of these pieces together. Appreciate you, brother. I, I'm gonna stop this in just a minute, I, I promise. But this is a significant moment and um, would, would all of those who are serving on our admin council, our SPRC committee, our finance committee, and our trustees, would you stand, and our missions committee, uh, would you stand? Thank you, thank you, thank you. John Sterling, you need to stand up. I didn't recognize you were sitting back there. Stand up. John Sterling was also a member of our executive team. A man of very high character and integrity. And uh, he too took um, what we were doing, uh, the work that we were doing uh, during this last year as a, Although he's a little bit retired, he still has a job and he took this on as a job and um, I read thousands of pages of legal documents. And so uh, thank you, John Sterling, for, for all that you do. Love you, brother. Um, last but not least, any of uh, Robert Ingram in the house today? Robert Ingram here? I can't see up there because of the lights. All right, I think he's gonna join us for lunch. All right, y'all ready to get started? I wanna invite you to stand with me, if you will, out of respect for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Uh, the title of my message today is Trusting the Future to God. Trusting the Future to God. I'm gonna be in Exodus uh, chapter 14. And I want to read verses 10 through verses through verse 15. Hear these words. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked up and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the, the word that the Lord spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. 
Then the Lord said to to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this morning and we are celebrating what you have done. God, not what we did, but what you have done. God, I am thankful today that that your, your love and your grace and your mercy is upon all of us. And I'm thankful today that uh, your sovereignty is at work and uh, the providence of of ordering our steps has has been a part of of what's happened here. And so today, God, as we, we come, our hearts are bowed and we humble ourselves before you and give thanks. To you, Lord, be all the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. I want you to hear today that I believe in the sovereignty of God. I don't believe in the, I don't just believe in the sovereignty of God because it is in every book in every chapter on every page of the Bible. I I, I don't just believe in the sovereignty of God because of those things. I also believe in the sovereignty of God because I have experienced his sovereignty at work in the hearts and the lives of this people here today. The sovereignty of God the sovereignty, uh, the sovereignty of God is his overarching orchestration of all that happens in time and eternity. It's the orchestration of everything in all of time and eternity. It's the sovereignty of God. It, it is the, it's a sovereignty and the power of God that is at work in the hearts and lives of, of people in the world as this gospel is moving forward throughout eternity. See, I believe in the sovereignty of God. It's one of the, the, the many characteristics of, of God that just overwhelms me at times. You ever been in a place where you've just been overwhelmed by the presence of God, that that you were there and something was was happening, the the Spirit of God was at work in in your life, or maybe it was in a worship service and and you felt that this the presence of God. I'm fascinated by the sovereignty of God, the overarching orchestration of all time and eternity. It's pre-Genesis 1-1. You realize that, right? In order for there to, to be a moment in which God says, let there be, there, there had to be a God already there, right? And so God was, was there in the very beginning and he spoke those words again. He said, let it be. And you know what happened? There was. See, he stands outside the bounds of of time and eternity. He is sovereign over all of those things. And it's because of his sovereignty that we can stand in the the midst of of some of the most difficult moments in our lives and and in this church, and and we can stand in, in Psalm 4610. You know what it says? It says, stand Chill out, take a chill pill, relax, be calm, and know that I'm God. See, as a blood-bought, grace-filled, redeemed follower of Jesus, I find great peace in God's sovereignty of knowing that that God is at work in the world, that, that he is um, orchestrating the uh, events of what's taking place uh, around us and, and through us to, to foresee and to push forth his will in, in the world. And, and we get to be a part of that. And that's so awesome today. You see, I believe in the, this overarching work of God, this, this incredible umbrella of God work in the world. And, but under that umbrella is this 
other word that I really, really like. And it's providence. That God's not just at work in the, the, the world and uh, orchestrating time and eternity, but that great big God um, comes all the way down and he at works and he works in your life and, and my life and that he is ordering our steps and, and making a way and he is doing things that sometimes we, we don't really like what he's doing, but he's doing things that, and he is at work in us and, and through us. See, I love providence. I love providence. Providence, again, it gives me this, this great comfort in knowing that, that no matter what's going on in my life, no matter the circumstances that I may be facing today, that God is there, even in the tough times. Even in those, those times, those moments when, when I thought all was lost, I'm glad you didn't see me in those moments. Casey did. When I just wanted to throw up my hands and say, it's over, it's not going to work, I'll just bow out. Thank God for a praying church and praying leaders and people like you who, who stood tall in some tough moments. Today we can stand back and we celebrate the providence of God at work in our lives. You know, God's at work in us and, and through us. See, we, we see God's providence in Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And we see the providence of God also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You know the scripture, right, that, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to, to do good works, which God prepared, where? In advance for us to do. He was orchestrating the, the events of our lives. In, in those moments when we are facing times of trouble and heartache, and hardship. Some of you are walking through uh, that season right now in your own life and in your own home that you're, you're walking through a, a difficult time. And I just want you to hear today that, that God ain't finished with you yet, that God is at work in your life and in your, your circumstances. And if you will allow him, if you'll make him Lord of your life and over your situation, you can know today that that providence of God is with you, orchestrating your steps, guiding your way. Do you believe that this morning? Do you, do you believe that God is at work in your life? Do you believe today that no matter where you may be standing today, that God is there? Can we trust him that he has our best interest at heart? Can we believe that even though the time may be difficult and the moment may be hard, that God is doing something in us and through us, preparing us for what lies next? See, I love the, the sovereignty and the, the providence of God. And nowhere... I would suggest in all of the scriptures do we see this sovereignty of God and the providence of, of God played out more than in the, life, the lives of Moses and the children of Israel. You, you could argue that that's the, the number one chapter in terms of providence and, and, and sovereignty and all of the scripture. I mean, just think about how Moses uh, began to, to got to the place where he could stand in that place to lead the, the children out of Israel. I mean, think about it. Here, here's a guy who is a Hebrew and uh, the Pharaoh of the day, the new Pharaoh, he comes in and he decides that he's going to uh, kill all of the firstborn babies of the Israelites. He, it's not the same Pharaoh that was there during the days of Joseph. This is a new sheriff in town. And he's ordered this, this murder of, of all the firstborn sons of the Hebrews. 
And it'd be Moses' sister, you remember, that she places him in a basket and she puts him at float on, on the, the water. And in, and, in by, and in God's providence that uh, Moses uh, floats right by the palace. I mean, just, just accidental, just floated right by there. And it just so happened that in that moment that, that the, the queen and, and some of the princesses were out there and, and they scoop him up. And Moses becomes a... A Hebrew, or is a Hebrew who becomes a son of Egypt and a prince. And there he is, a couple of bad decisions, a, a murder takes place, and Moses finds himself on the outskirts of town, taking after, looking after his father in law's sheep. And then God, in his providence, finds Moses when he is so far away. So far away. He, he thinks he has outrun God and outrun God's plan and purposes for his life that he's way out there in the wilderness and, and, and something amazing happens. You remember, he sees a bush that is burning. It is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And the voice of the Lord comes and said, Moses, you gonna be the guy to lead my people out of Egypt. And here we are as we pick up this story in Exodus chapter 14. And I want you to imagine this sight for just a moment. Here are the, the children of Israel. There's not just several hundreds of them. There are several hundred thousand of them. They, they've left Egypt and here they are there. They've camped out by the, the Red Sea and all of a sudden in the, this moment where they see Pharaoh and the Egyptian army and all their chariots and horses and they're coming after them. And here they are, literally they are trapped. Egyptians on one side, Red Sea on the other. And the only way that they are going to survive that moment is for God to show up. For God to perform a miracle. For something to happen that was outside of their ability. And God did. And a miracle took place. But there's one part of this that I, I want us to understand. Is that the miracle didn't happen until they decided to take a step faith. If you read the scripture, there's, there's a time where uh, Moses says, hey guys, we're going to start marching towards the sea. That's my paraphrase, but that's what happened. He, he, he said, we're going to start marching towards the ocean. Can you imagine all of those people walking towards the, the Red Sea? They're just going to just keep walking. And, and can you imagine what was going through their mind in that time? Man, what is this guy doing? Is he crazy? I told y'all Moses wasn't the right guy. We should have chosen somebody else. He's got us marching towards the water. But when they took that step, Moses got to the edge of the water and the scripture said that he held out his staff. You remember what happened? If you've been to Sunday school, you know what happened. The waters parted, didn't they? A miracle took place. A, a wind came, a, a great, strong, mighty wind. It came, it came across the water and it heaped the water up so that all of those people could walk through on dry ground. It took a step of faith. See, it's always the step of faith that comes before the miracle. It's the only way that this works, right? That God wants us, you and me, to trust him with everything that we have. Let me tell you, it's with our wallets, amen? It's with our wallets. That wasn't a good enough amen. Amen. <laughs> It's with the, our, our lives, it's with our jobs, it's with our, our families, even the ones that are off at college, praise God. It, it, he wants us to trust him with our lives. It's the same for us today. If we wanna see God move in us and through us and through Mount Bethel Church, 
it's going to require a step of faith. Maybe two. If we go back to verse 15, there's a moment, verse 15 says that um, Moses was crying out to the Lord. I actually know what that feels like. To, to be in your prayer closet and saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to. I, and evidently that's where Moses was. But did you hear what the Lord said? He said, why are you crying out to me, Moses? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. You see, there's always a time for prayer, but there comes a time where we have to act. And this was a moment of action in which they had to take a step of faith in order to see God work a miracle. And God did. They believed wholeheartedly that the providence of God was at work in their lives. They, they believed that, that God had, had called them for, for this moment in time. They, they believed that although there was some, some noise out there on the sides, there were some folks who, who didn't want to go with them, they, they believed wholeheartedly that, that God was moving and at work in them. And so they did something incredible. They just took a step of faith. And the water's parted. There's one other part that's important for us to see. I didn't read this section. I hope that today you'll go back and read all of uh, Exodus 14. But as they are making their way out of slavery in Egypt towards the promised land, the scripture says that there was this, uh, in the New American Standard Bible, it says that um, there was a pillar of cloud that went out before them. That, that, that is the, a representation of, of God's presence at work uh, in their lives. And so every day they would wake up and they would follow the cloud. Uh, they would just follow the cloud and the cloud would show them the way and tell them how to get where they were going. All they needed to do was have faith and trust and, and follow the cloud. Something really neat happened. Right about the time that the waters were parted. Is the cloud, God's presence that had been in front of them moved behind them. And it created a barrier between God's people and the Egyptian army. This darkness came and although they were very close, they couldn't see them. Can you imagine that? The, the Egyptians who are chasing the uh, children uh, of God, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, they, they can't see them. There, there's, a, there's a darkness out there. They, they were just right there. Where did they go? The darkness was hiding them on one side. But on the other side, something incredible has taken place. Is that same cloud was shining a light. Isn't that awesome? Darkness on one side, light on the other side. But here's the thing, is that it would only shine on the next step. It, it, it wouldn't show them the whole path. It, it didn't show them how things were gonna turn out. It, it, it didn't show them where they were gonna end up. It, it didn't show me just the next step. And as they took the next step, the light would show them the next step. And as they took that step, guess what happened? The light would show them the next step. And they crossed over on dry ground. Do you know that's what God wants to do for us today? That we too would, would cross over on dry ground? It requires, what does it require? The very first thing is that we have to trust and believe in the providence of God over our lives that he's called us for this moment. We have to believe it. We have to trust it. We have to know that he's working in us and through us. And then, doggone it, we gotta take a step of faith. Let me be the bearer of some challenging news for y'all today. It's challenging because we, 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 like to, we, we like to know stuff. 
we want to know that we want to see the map. I, I need to see a plan. I, I need you, Jody, uh, and leadership to create a strategy that we can follow. I need to know every detail and every circumstance because that's who we are. But you know what God does for folks like you and me? He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you the next step. And as we walk, he illuminates the way. One more thing that I need to bring up. It's one of the more sobering parts of this scripture, this story. And that is, is that there was a people, matter of fact, there was a whole generation of the children of Israel who never got to see the promised land. They died in the wilderness. They never got to, to walk in it. They never were able to enjoy the, the, the fruits of the land and the blessings of the moment. They didn't get to, to see it. And that hurts me. I don't know. It hurts me to think about that. Because how is it possible that a people could see a miracle of God take place. They saw waters part. They saw a water come from a rock. They, they ate manna in the, the wilderness. And when they grumbled that they didn't like the menu, they asked God for meat and he sent them quail. I mean, they had everything. Their clothes did not wear out. Wish that blessing would come to my house. Their clothes didn't wear out. How could that people see all of those things, all of those miracles, and not go into the promised land? You know why? They were afraid. They were fearful. They were gripped by fear. They looked out into the desert and they couldn't see the promised land right there in front of them. They just had the words of the promised land. They knew it was out there, but they didn't make it. And it was because they were afraid. I mean, how can you be afraid? But before we throw too many rocks at them, sometimes we can be just like them, can't we? That's an amen moment. We can be just like them. I can be just like them. I can look out at the sea of, uh, of challenge for the church. I can see the, the waves of change that are taking place around the world. I can see the darkness that's uh, uh, rising up all around us. I can look out at a, a world that just seems to be going to hell in a handbasket at times. And I can be afraid. But here's the thing, God didn't ask me to save the world. He didn't ask you to save the world. But he certainly wants to use this people at Mount Bethel to share the goodness and the love of God in this community and the world. See, God didn't call this place to, to be a shield, to, that Mount Bethel Church would be a shield from the world. That's not what this is. He called us to be a church that would rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and would proclaim the goodness of the gospel into brokenness that is far more broken than you can even imagine that he's called us that we might rise up not on our own accord but in the power of the Holy Spirit and that we might move with a relentless passion to share Jesus with everybody that we come in contact with. And when we believe and we know and we trust God in that area, church, let me just tell you, you'll see miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle happen in your life and in this place. You want God's providence 
It worked in your life. Do you want to have that moment where you can be in the most difficult place in the world and and have this confidence to know that, that God is at work in you and in your circumstances? Then let me tell you, it's all about lordship. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Is Jesus Lord? See, there, there was a time in my life where I was, um, I, I was a, a good uh, Christian business person. I was in my dad's church. I even was the chairman of the finance committee, if you can believe that. And I was doing good things and I was writing checks and I was showing up and I was going through all the motions. But that's not lordship. Lordship is when we make the, cons- the, the, the decision that we're going to step over here into a new place and say, Lord, where I move from this spot is where you lead. It begins when I wake up in the morning. Lord, who are you gonna put in front of me today? God, who, who are you gonna give for me to, to share your goodness and your grace and your, your love to? And see, when, when I put myself in this place, Blake Sims, I don't have to worry about the future because God's got me. And when I decide that I'm gonna follow him faithfully, I can know that, Lord, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this one, but I believe in you and I trust you in all of your goodness and your grace. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he Lord today? Today's a good day to start out on a new path for Jesus. Father, I'm thankful today for your love for us. I'm thankful today, God, that in those moments when we don't know how or what or when, that we can rest in that place like the psalmist wrote, to be still and know that you are God. Let it be so for us in Jesus' name. Amen.